So it's now almost universally thought in the academy that human beings should be identifying with uh, their bodies or with a certain material organism. This view turns out to be somewhat problematic. There are, there are problems that arise with thinking of the identifying human persons with just their bodies. What are some of these problems? Well, one of, one of them is just that uh, bodies are fuzzy, vague kinds of objects. Um, they're no more sharply bounded when you look closely than, say, a cloud. Um, and when you, you, you see the cloud from below, it looks like it's sharply separated from the blue sky. Um, you get in a plane and fly into the cloud. If someone were to ask you, are we in the cloud yet? Are we in the cloud yet? Are we in the cloud yet? There would be these times when, well, there's some wispy vapors, but you're not in the cloud. And then there'd be more and more uh, uh, vapor, and then eventually it'll be dark, and you know you are in the cloud. Um, now, what's the right way to think about clouds, given that they're vague in this way? The natural way to think about them is there's all these things there, um, all these um, masses of water and air, uh, and which one of them is the cloud? Well, there's no real answer to that. Um, uh, and when you're inside of all of the good candidates for being the cloud, then you're definitely in the cloud. When you're just inside of some of them, you're on the periphery, you're kind of in the cloud, kind of not. Um, well, human bodies and human brains are a lot like that when you, uh, when you look closely. There's bits coming in, bits going out, and... Uh, uh, One thinks here about the movie The Incredible Voyage. Uh, was that the 19th? No, Fantastic Voyage. Oh, the Fantastic Voyage. Fantastic Voyage. Right. 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 If you could be shrunk down small enough, right. you'd be in this system of particles yeah. that was very cloud-like. Yeah. Uh, and on the borders, it would be unclear whether or not these particles are part of the yes. body or not. Yeah, this bit of oxygen is being, mm -hmm. is being uh, transported across a cell wall or something. When exactly does it become part of the of the body inside the lungs, and when is it just a bit of gas floating around uh, uh, in there? Um, now, what's wrong with supposing that we're vague, fuzzy things, uh, kind of like clouds? Um, well, if we're going to think about human bodies in the same way that we're thinking about clouds, that would mean right here in this chair, wearing these clothes, there's a whole bunch of different things. They're all roughly my shape and size and weight. And it really doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter which one of them we focus on because uh, they're all very similar. They all have brains inside their heads. Um, if each one of those things is conscious, alive, aware, awake, there's a whole bunch of conscious beings here. And, uh, uh, Millions. Millions, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And given the number of bits at the exterior, uh, uh, or the bits that are inside about to, to be absorbed or, or shed, um, this is going to explode, yeah. the, the number of these things. Um, and that's a little bit, I don't know, it induces some vertigo, I think, yeah. or it should. Um, uh, of course, Perhaps that's what we should conclude that we are. You know, science reveals surprising things. Where you thought there was a sharp boundary, there isn't a sharp boundary. Um, and uh, so perhaps that's something we have to live with. Um, Can I, th there's, another, there's another way of going here. You, you might look at a cloud and think, um, and think there's not lots and lots of clouds there, but nor is it plausible to think there's one cloud there because the, the boundaries are so vague. I, I think maybe the better way of thinking about it is, strictly speaking, there's not a cloud there at all. What there are are a bunch of particles mm. arranged cloud-wise, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. And that's really the more precise way of describing what's going on metaphysically. 
and then you bring this down to the level of bodies or organisms, and since when you get to the very small, we're cloud-like. Mm -hmm. I think some, well, I'm sort of tempted to think, that strictly speaking, there's a bunch of particles arranged organism-wise here, mm -hmm. and there isn't any thing which is this organism. Yeah, so if, if when you look closely, you find that something is really just a swarm of other things organized in a certain way, Act, behaving in a certain way, um, hanging together or working together to replicate uh, some of their parts. And if, if, if when you discover that, your reaction is, oh, there isn't just one thing here, there's a whole bunch of things. It's kind of like a swarm of bees. Yeah. Um, in that case, uh, you really have a powerful reason to think that I'm not just this body. Because I do know that I exist, whatever else I know. And if, if in fact, there isn't a body here, there's just a bunch of bits of matter kind of working together to, you know, working together to keep my clothes from, <laughs> from falling off, um, then uh, you really must be something else. Of course, you know, you might think that you're some tiny part. I could be a little tiny yeah. particle in my head yeah. somewhere. But, that, but uh, that's not. hard to credit mm -hmm. because the, there's no uh, distinguished particle that we've identified. So, you know, there just doesn't seem to be a good candidate for that. Um, now if, on the other hand, you think, well, wherever you've got a swarm of things, you know, like a swarm of bees, um, or, or some gas inside of a balloon holding the walls out, or the edges, or the, the, the skin out. Wherever you've got a bunch of things that are doing something together, you've also got a hole that's yeah. made out of those things. Mm -hmm. Then, then it, discovering that my body is a swarm of things uh, doesn't lead directly to the conclusion that um, I must be something else. Um, nevertheless, because there are so many of them, you have a puzzling question about uh, which one you are, or how you could sort of indef be indeterminately all of them, or something like that. Um, now, we, we get used to th this idea, I think, when we're dealing with inanimate objects or, or when, we're when we're dealing with artifacts. Um, it doesn't bother us that the car, you know, that you're driving um, has little bits at the periphery that aren't clearly on or off. You know, it, my car has probably more of these than, <laughs> than, uh, than most, and, and some of them are larger than you might have thought. <laughs> it's not entirely clear whether that fender is a part of my car any it's longer. It's barely hanging on. It's barely hanging on. Uh, I've got to get some duct tape on it, actually. <laughs> uh, but, you know, bits of the rubber on the tires um, are about to come off, you know are those parts of the car. Um, do you want to call the, the GPS that's you know, plugged into the lighter uh, part of the car? Well, how about if it's sort of attached to the dash? How much does it have, you know, how, how, sh how firmly does it have to be attached to the dash to be part of the car? Uh, so in this case, I think we're happy to say it just doesn't matter. It's a matter of, of our just deciding to call the GPS part of the car if it's attached with glue. Yeah. Uh, and we'll say it's not part of the car if it's attached with a suction cup. You know? It's an arbitrary It's an arbitrary boundary. And we could lay it down the one way or we could lay it down the other way. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. There are these things there. If, if, if we're giving up the swarm view, there are these things there, these hunks of metal and plastic. One of them includes all the car plus the GPS, and one of them doesn't. And we can just decide which, you know, which we're talking about um, from, for purposes of ownership. Say, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I sell you the thing, we better decide whether that's going to be part of it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and it's up to us. Um, it's hard to think about oneself in that sort of way. Um, so is it just sort of up to us whether to include within my boundaries um, uh, a, a dead hair that's just about to come out of my 
my uh, head or, uh, or, or my fingernails. You know, they're not, tips of them are getting kind of long and kind of dead. <laughs> um, you know, is that part of me or not? Well, we could just, if, if in fact, a body is just a vague swarm um, and these, these bits are sort of on the periphery, we can feel free if we want to talk about all of me except for those little bits. Or we could talk about a larger thing. Um, now, does, am, am I able thereby to change the, uh, change the facts about what I'm referring to? When, when I'm talking about a, a, a living body. Um, if so, then you run into problems about how consciousness is hooked up to these things. Yeah, so <clears throat> one, one natural way of thinking about it is there are all of these overlapping hunks of bio stuff. Yeah. And consciousness is hooked up to lots and lots of them. Mm -hmm. So there are many conscious beings. Yeah. Um, it's a mystery. It's a sort of puzzle, I guess, for the philosophy of language. Which of them or how many of them the word I picks out. But, um, but one natural way of going, I guess, if you're going to embrace this picture is what, what the surprising thing we learn from science is there are millions upon millions of conscious mm -hmm. beings mm -hmm. sitting in this chair right now. Um, and now what, what, what I, I suppose someone could say, well, that's a surprise, but... but um, yeah, we learned lots of surprising things. We thought the Earth was flat, so... Right. Uh, but now it strikes me that one of the reasons it's, it's, it's not quite in that category is... Um, you wonder whether some of these things... Um, what, what happens when I cycle... Um, I cycle material in and then it goes out. Mm -hmm. And who knows, maybe I've been doing this for long enough that the stuff that made me up 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is now spread out around the atmosphere somewhere. Yeah. Some surrounding it. Um, yeah. So it, if, if hunks of matter are real, and they certainly get treated as real when we're doing things like working out what, you know, what, how strong a chair has to be to hold you and things like that, um, we treat these hunks of matter as real. Um, there's a hunk of matter there, and it's going to be spread all through uh, the atmosphere and the ground and taken up into other organisms and so on. Um, now what's the relationship between that thing and you? The worry is, what if, what if I am a hunk of matter that in 10 years is going to be spread out like that? Yeah, your future <laughs> is kind of bleak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's not the kind of thing I can just say, oh well, science has taught us an interesting thing. Right. Now something really fundamental about how I look at the world has, has changed. changed. Yeah. A another, another puzzling thing uh, arises if you think that consciousness is a special extra feature of the world in addition to the physical goings on. So if you think the brain is like a computer, thinking is like computation, um, it's, it's probably okay to say, oh, there's all these objects here. They all have a computer inside of them, namely the brain, and that thing is doing the thinking uh, and thinking is just computation. Um, uh, okay, that might be all right, but if you think that consciousness is an extra something, um, if, if you take uh, Leibniz's thought experiment seriously, Leibniz said, suppose the brain were blown up to the size of a mill and you could walk around inside of it. He was thinking of a factory. Um, you wouldn't see consciousness there anywhere. Uh, there wouldn't be any feelings or thoughts. And um, if you take that seriously, then you think, well, when you have a brain that's functioning, a new property comes into being, namely uh, uh, being conscious. 
There's, there's new uh, feelings, uh, thoughts, sensations, and these are not just a matter of the physics of the brain. If that's your view, then you have to suppose that something has those, mm -hmm. and it then becomes an open empirical question what that thing is. Um, you found this swarm of things in the vicinity of your head and your body. Um, is it one of those things that has gotten this new feature? Um, if so, which one? Yeah. How did it get selected? Does, the, does consciousness get spread over all these things? Are there all these uh, uh, many fuzzy objects or objects that are, that are sharp but just slightly different from one another? Is each one of them conscious? And if so, how did the consciousness just stop there uh, and not spread out to include some things that had my sweater as a part? And, um, given that these objects are not very special from the point of view of fundamental physical laws, um, it would be surprising if the laws of consciousness generation were to select one of these gigantic arbitrarily bounded objects. Right, without selecting its, its neighbors. Its neighbors, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, it might be natural to think that the brain is the thing that's primarily thinking, but if consciousness involves a new feature, um, if when I have a headache there's a new property in addition to all the brain uh, the physical brain states, uh, something has to have that property. What is it? Uh, the traditional answer has been, it's my soul. You know, there's a further thing there. Um, if that's wrong, then it's got to be a part of the brain, a whole bunch of parts of the brain. Um, and uh, none of these look like very natural candidates to be showing up in a fundamental law of, of any kind. Yeah. Now, of course, lots of philosophers don't think consciousness is fundamental, mm -hmm. that there are basic laws about, about it, but many do uh, because of Leibniz-like thought experiments and, mm 